Along those lines, uh, Norma, I guess the Lydia Sunday School class is starting back up uh, this next Sunday. So this is a women's class that meets upstairs in room 203 at 10 o'clock, which will be right after this service, so it's convenient. All women are welcome, and oh, see Lori Udell if you have questions about this group, or Norma too, I guess, right? All right, so see those ladies, and they will hook you up. Okay, so SPY which stands for St. Paul Youth. Youth. Very good. Who, are, who came up with that, Lori? That's very clever. David, did you get credit for that? I'll give it to Ella. Okay, all right. So we're gonna pass the buck is what I'm seeing. Okay, well done. I like that, David. So St. Paul Youth kickoff event next Sunday. So we actually have all the details now. So. Uh, let's see, the Littles and the Middles will have a tie-dye and water party from 5 to 6.30. And I assume that'll be right here at the church, right? Yeah. Okay? And then the Bigs, which is 6th grade and up, uh, there'll be a pool party at the Yates, and I assume that's at the exact same time, correct? Okay. So questions on that, and you can ask or check with the church office. That shit sounds like fun. All youth are welcome and bring your friends, okay? Uh, justice and mercy. So the Patriots Day First Responders Breakfast is to honor first responders. That will be held on September 11th from 5.30 to 8.30 a.m. in Elizabeth Brown Park. I don't know about you, that's a little early for me. But. <laughs> That sounds like somebody who's speaking with the voice of experience. Yes, I see. Yes, yes, the voice of reason. Fair enough. So you can help by providing breakfast foods and disposable plates, cups, napkins, or flatware. And if you're an early riser, you can get up and greet and serve the first responders from 5.30 to 8.30. So please contact Norma Brown if you would like uh, more information about this. And Norma, I'm going to have them call you at like you know, 4, 430 that morning, you know, to more information. Yeah, right. Okay. That's, that sounds like lots of fun. Okay, so today is Communion Sunday, so there will be no children's church so that the kids can participate in this uh, important, you know, communion event with their families. Now let's see, the offering basket is on the high table in the back. It's a green basket back there. I'll start to say it's next to SJ, but she's actually sitting, so it's not next to SJ. Um, and last, it's time to stand and sing. Now, let me tell you, you gotta be warned. This first song, we're gonna go from zero to like 100 miles an hour in 1.8 seconds, so <laughs> buckle up, let's go. parts that were so messed up, but I love the part where you showed up, right in my past, right in my hurt, line by line, word by word, and now my story is a living proof, there's not a chapter you can use, my story, your glory, my pain, your purpose, my mess, your Scars, part of your plan. Take all of my heart, Lord, here I am. My only cause to call me home is knowing you more and making you known. My story, your glory, my pain, your purpose, my mess, your message, and all things I know your work in. One life, one mission, one reason why.
What is your work? How do you spend your days? What are you making? What are you getting done? What do you accomplish with your hours? What is your work? For those in Christ, there are better questions. Who do you worship in the work that you do? Who are you serving in your labor? Whose glory drives your effort? How does how you do your work reveal the character of God? Will tomorrow be measured in dollars and hours and completed tasks? Or will the day be counted in eternity as one spent in service to the King? In the name of Jesus, we will strive for excellence. We will build with integrity. We will create order and beauty. And whatever we do with our hands, our hearts will declare, I am a living sacrifice. This is my offering to you. That is our work. Children come forward for our time mostly for children. Good morning, how are y'all doing? Well, at least one of you. Here we come, here we come. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good morning. I was thinking of, do y'all have to go to, to school on Monday? You do? No. Some of them do, some of you don't. Some of you who are homeschooled, do you still get off on, on Labor Day? No? No? Yeah, that you have friends, and they have to go to school on Labor Day? Yeah. So. Okay, they don't have to do it on Labor Day. That's good. You've got a good principle. <laughs> what do you all want to be when you grow up? Have you thought about that? What do you want to be? I'm a science teacher. A science teacher? Are a scientist. Either either one of those is, is really good. Yeah. One probably pays more than the other, but you'll figure that out. <laughs> what what else? Does anybody else know what they want to be when they when they grow up? No? Yes. An art teacher. That's beautiful too. I like I like that. I need an art teacher because my I, my art is not good at all. Uh, my children were much better at art than I ever was. Anybody else? Nobody else? Well, we work, don't we? Do y'all work? I mean, I know you don't get, you know, an enormous paycheck, do you yet? You don't get paid at all, but you do some work, don't you? Right. Sometimes you do work and you don't get paid for it, and that's called love. <laughs> Parents can thank me later. That's right. This Monday, we celebrate labor. And that doesn't sound like it'd be much fun to celebrate, would it? Unless, maybe, you're doing the kinds of things that you want to do, you know, don't you think? If, you know, you want to be a science teacher or a scientist, and you are one of those, then that may be like a fun thing to do, right? Or an art teacher, if you're, if you're teaching art to uh, kids that have no clue what they're doing, and, you know, all of a sudden they are able to draw a stick figure, then, you know, you have accomplished something, right? So work can be both. La labor sounds like you're, 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 you're working, because when I think of labor, I think of, of well, I'm not going to tell you what I'm thinking of with labor, uh, but that's a lot of work. Uh, and we celebrated that someone went through a lot of work uh, to do that. But 
Labor Day is a celebration of all of our work, but it's not just about making money, right? Sometimes you get some money. If you do like a special chore, do you sometimes get a little extra, you know, a, a little a little something something? If you do that, no? Yeah, yeah, a little a dollar, a dollar fifty, two dollars, and uh, and uh, but anyway. We all work, don't we? And when we get to a certain age, we've got to go to work, don't we? Sometimes those jobs are just like, okay, I've got to make money, and so you just put that, you put that baby together, you know, so that you can pay the bills. But sometimes you can do some work. And even if you've got one of those, you know, jobs where you're just trying to make it, make it happen, you can also do fun things in work on the side, right? Like volunteering at the church. Do you know that most people who work at this church don't get paid? Matter of fact, most of the people who work here at the church pay, pay the church so that they can work, sort of. You, why would they do that? Huh? To be nice, that's right. And it's also because of love. We talked about that just a minute ago, didn't we? Didn't I say something about love? That's right. That's right. They love the church. They love what the church is doing. And we can also... Uh, in our work, even if we're making some money and we're not real thrilled with what we do, we can give part of that money to the church, to Jesus, and to his mission, and that brings us joy, does it not? To see that everybody has something to do and that, you know, when we talked about all this stuff that's going on with the Yancey women and the youth and the children and tie-dyeing and all of that, that just doesn't pop out of the sky, does it? No, it takes people to volunteer to do that. It takes some money to buy the T-shirts and the dye, and, the, and the, it took some money to buy the swimming pool, right? So, yes, and we can share that with others. And so when we come to Labor Day, I know that's not exactly what we celebrate on this coming Monday, but we can celebrate that we give glory to God through all of our work and all of our labor. Whether we find it joyful or not, we can make it joyful by giving to God all that God asks us to give. And so today we come and celebrate Labor Day and we're going to celebrate about giving when we get around this table because we're going to talk about here in just a second, those of you who are hanging out with us, uh, is that uh, Jesus gave his love in a way that we could not even imagine affording. So we give you thanks, give you thanks. Let's, let's have a prayer. God, we thank you for our work. We thank you that you give us dreams about what we, can, what we can be and do as we grow up. We thank you that even as small children, our work is valuable in your sight, that we can help each other in Jesus' name. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Okay, we got some free, free, I say free in quotes because someone had to buy this stuff. It wasn't me. Go ahead and grab you a snack. Uh, today's scripture is from John 6, 1 through 15. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, but he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five bar barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, 
withdrew again to a mountain by himself. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So our next song is Come As You Are. This is appropriate for Communion Sunday. So one of the tenets of the Methodist Church is a believer, the belief that all of us are welcome at God's table. And this song really talks about that. So as you sit there, you know, enjoy, but you know, enter into kind of a worshipful attitude as we enter into this time. sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let a rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come kneel earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal so lay down your
good morning. Will you please pray with me? Hi, God. We come before you on this beautiful, sunny Sunday on Labor Day weekend. Tomorrow, we honor the laborers that contributed to the well-being, strength, and prosperity of our great country. We are so thankful. We thank you, God, for providing for us every day and pray that we have the desire and ability to do your work and be a blessing to the people around us that are suffering and in need. Let us be open to hearing your voice and doing your will. Next week, the youth will start meeting on Sunday night. Lots of meetings are being held and new classrooms are being cleaned and set up. Please help everyone involved with these special young people. Be a blessing to them and their growth as Christians. I was on the internet this week and I read an interesting statement. It said, stop looking for the perfect church. Go worship a perfect God today with a congregation of flawed people who need grace as much as you do. May we always remember you are a perfect God. In your name we pray. Amen. Series in uh, get on the boat, get in the boat, on the boat, just get, get with the boat. Adventures with Jesus, and uh, we've had several of those. And perhaps what we've been learning uh, is that uh, when we get on the boat with Jesus and we go on an adventure with Him, there is sometimes, at least in Scripture, and the first people to get on the boat, the disciples with Jesus, there's a lot of underestimating and unpreparedness for the power of of Jesus. Over these past couple of Sundays, we've been looking at that. Last Sunday, we, we, uh, we um, forgot our lunch. The disciples forgot their lunch. And Jesus says, well, you just aren't getting it. You're just not understanding. You know, the lunch is not the problem. Uh, the misunderstanding is the problem. And then, of course, we, uh, they went on their vacation I know everyone's been on their vacation just about now. If not, they're on there now, and they'll have to watch this. Welcome those who are watching this next Sunday. Their vacation gets interrupted, and Jesus shows, shows them why he is really here. It's not about taking vacations, even though that's very important, and taking time apart is important, especially for our spirituality, is that he's here to share compassion, the compassion of God with the people and then before that we saw about Jesus who heals a woman and and the disciples are just flabbergasted that you know he feels that the power has gone out of him and this woman has touched him who's had the issue of blood for for 12 years and and uh, he turns around and says who touched me and the disciples are just like everyone's touching you or it's like you know going through a crowd at the UT uh, uh, UVA games you're gonna bump into some people I promise I'm going to leave that alone. I don't remember. Don't encourage him. It was close, I think. When it, when it, maybe they'll play Virginia Tech sometime and it'll work out better. I don't know. Anyway, their vacation, the, 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 I'm backing up to the vacation. See, I've got vacation on the mind. Um, and then, of course, the raising of, the, of, of Jairus' uh, daughter. Uh, she was really dead, uh, but uh, we decided, Jesus said that she was asleep. And uh, so we raised, we raised her, and we see the power of Jesus. But we still are having trouble comprehending what Jesus can really do and why he is really here. So let us talk about it, and, and of course, as school has started, uh, a lot of times a lot of things happen, and it's centered around testing. Uh, I don't know how you all feel about taking a test. It's not usually my uh, favorite thing, even though I usually do pretty well. I do better on the tests than I do in the course of study. So my sister was just the opposite. You gave her a test, and she looked like she was a moron. Uh, but she became valedictorian of her class of, you know, 450, so she could do something. Uh, so we sometimes freak out about a test. We hate them. Uh, and why do we hate them? Because they usually point out uh, flaws in our education or in our study habits or in something else. 
But now today we sort of see that we're getting a quick lesson, just a quick one, uh, for the disciples. And it's on uh, the class, the lesson is the power of Jesus 101. Uh, and so it starts out the class uh, with a pop quiz. It's an oral pop quiz, and if you're not familiar with those, then you didn't go to Emory and Henry, uh, because I don't know if the professors were just lazy. Uh, they would just say, we're going to do a quiz, or a, a, they call them orals, where you just went in and they asked you just random questions, and you, just, you, you didn't have time to think about it. You just had to come up with it. And that's what sort of <laughs> happens with Jesus and the disciples, is they get an oral pop quiz. Uh, and so Philip is, Philip is up to bat and uh, talk about an oral pop quiz. He asked, Jesus asks, uh, the, we well, asked the group, I guess Philip just came up with this answer, but where can we buy bread to feed these people? Well, there's 5,000 of them. And so he might as well have asked, uh, how, can we get, how can we bring about world peace? You know, that would be just about as easy as how do we feed 5,000 people? And basically, Philip looks at the situation, and he, then he responds by saying, it's hopeless. Nothing can be done. I pick D, none of the above, final answer. Then Andrew, knowing that is not the right answer. Oh my gosh, Philip, are you so stupid? That was from last Sunday. <laughs> Andrew says... Uh, that's not a really good answer. I'm going to come up with a better one. Well, there are, well, there's this boy, and he has five loaves and two fishes. But, there's a but, you know, how, how in the world is that going to work out? Now, Philip, the first one, is not entirely has a bad approach to an overwhelming situation. It's practical. 5,000 people. We have hardly anything. It's realistic. It's not a state of denial. So a good therapist is thinking, you know, he's, he's working this out. That's, that's a good, healthy mental state to be in in the midst of an overwhelming situation. It's not being gullible. It's not getting caught in the trap of pie in the sky. Philip is right. D is the best answer, none of the above. There, it would take us, all of us working for half a year to come up with enough Happy Meals for this group. But while it is good to be realistic about any situation, Philip's approach is not a very good one because nothing happens positively to change the situation. The situation looks to be hopeless nothing can be done well you know what's going to happen if you look at a situation you say it's hopeless and nothing can be done nothing's going to be done the problem with that attitude is that it becomes self-fulfilling when we believe that nothing can be done then the situation does not indeed but the situation does indeed become hopeless so we are facing our problems at work and celebrating that this weekend or with our families, or in church, or society, the best way to ensure that there will be no improvements, no resolutions to our problems, is for us to sit back with Philip and to complain that it's hopeless, that nothing can be done. That algebra test is coming on Monday, but there's nothing that can be done. So why even try to study? That stack of bills keeps growing. It can't get any better, so why not just keep running up the credit card charges? That comes back to bite you later. Personal experience. <laughs> Work will never get better, so why even try? The marriage is over. That teenager is hopeless. There is power when we do not recognize or underestimate the power of Jesus. There is power when we do recognize and we estimate that there's another equation involved in our situation and that is the power of Jesus. The situation is hopeless. Nothing can be done. That is a very complete approach to dealing with the overwhelming. It works. 
It is good to be realistic and practical, but you have to have more than that. The point of this test question by Jesus, and it's, the test is even in the scripture that we read, is to point out that cautious calculations that operate only on the basis of possibility, while perhaps revered in this world, ignore the one who comes from above, the one who redefines what is possible. The point that we're talking about is that the cautious calculations that operate only on the basis of possibility why perhaps revered in the world ignore the one who comes from above the one who redefines what is possible the test is a trick it is a mind stretcher if we had read the message version of this they would have called it a faith stretcher instead of a test our reality our conventionalism our tradition versus God's power and God's grace our lives are full of experiences that seem to be overwhelming and beyond our capacity to handle and it doesn't matter how old or young we are we all face overwhelming and stressful situations could be the first day of school we just started that that can be overwhelming I remember my first day of school at elementary I had a, a friend a sixth grade friend my mom had hooked me up to and we were gonna ride the bus together and he was gonna tell me where to go and he did that the first day I got to I got there it was the second day when he wasn't helping me anymore it was like what did we do yesterday <laughs> went in the door did we turn left or did we turn right and that was that was where I was at that particular age or maybe we're trying to get a good score on the SAT or the ACT and to get into college, and, and that can be sort of stressful and overwhelming. Or it might be the stack of bills like we've talked about that grows and grows. Or waiting to hear from the doctor's office to learn about a test result. Or the frustration about a job. Or the fear that that job won't last. If you're dealing with cancer, you need a little fill-up. You have to face up to the seriousness of the illness. You have to be realistic. You have to seek medical help. But you have to recognize the power of Jesus to help as well. You need the bread of life. Jesus. Everything else will leave you still hungry for more. Only Jesus satisfies completely. Whatever the test life throws at you, you've got to face the problem. But more than anything else, you've got to have Jesus. If you don't have the bread of life, whatever else you do just won't be enough. Here's what I think it boils down to. The feeding, the feeding of the 5,000 is a miracle of abundance. When a large crowd comes marching toward Jesus and the disciples, Jesus plays a little test with Philip. He asks the disciple, where are we going to get bread for all of these people? And Philip begins to panic and stammer. Well, six months, wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to even get a little. Philip is feeling the scarcity of their resources and the enormity of the need. He makes the same mistake that so many churches make today, saying, oh, we don't have the budget or the ministry plan. I'm sorry. It's not on, it's not on the page, ministry plan. I'm sorry, Chris, it's not on there. We don't have the staff. We don't have the equipment or the time or the energy. Oh, my gosh, we've just come out of COVID. We're all exhausted. And Jesus just shakes his head. He knows very well what he is going to do. It says that at the very beginning. He gives him a test, but he knows at the very beginning what he's going to do. He is testing his disciples, trying to break them out of this scarcity mentality. Another disciple named Andrew does a little bit better, as we mentioned. There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. 
give Andrew some credit. At least he has a possible solution. But then he falls into the scarcity mentality and size. But what are they among so many people? Okay, Jesus thinks to himself, time to act. Make the disciples sit down. It says there was plenty of grass. And he says this to his disciples, and Jesus takes the loaves, gives thanks, and distributes the bread to the people on the grass. He also distributes the fish and gives them as much as they want, filling them until they are completely satisfied, verses 10 and 11. Remember, it's a miracle of abundance. Then, to stress that there is much more in this meal than anyone could eat, Jesus has the disciples gather up the leftovers, and they fill 12 baskets to the top. The people are so impressed that they begin to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. The feeding of the 5,000 shows the abundance of God's care for us. God does not want us to go hungry or to lack anything that we really need for life. God wants our needs to be met. God also wants crowds of hungry people to be fed. And often that is done by us and by other people of faith. Jesus is showing the demonstration of the test. He says, well, all we really need for this test to really fully take place is a table and some bread. Well, our story has some fish. We don't have fish today. I did not go fishing. And some juice. Jesus has gifts and resources to meet the full range of human needs feeding of the crowd confirms that Jesus is the source of life. And our scripture says that as they sat on the grass, he took those barley loaves and those fish and I don't know if the little boy had wine or not, but we'll just go there. And he took the bread just like he would later on when he's meeting with his disciples, maybe just to remind them a little bit about what has been taking place in their boating adventures with Jesus. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you. In remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ. So in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ. Oh God, we come this morning to offer ourselves, to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Praise your name in all that we do. We come before you to celebrate this mysterious gift of your power. So by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever and 
all God's people said. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in. Left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world.
boating adventure with Jesus. Oh, we'll sort of finish it. I don't know if we finish it. We'll continue to be on the boat. We'll just be doing something else. And uh, it's one of my favorite stories of the Bible, and so you'll have to look and see what, that, what that's coming up. But uh, the title is, It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. <laughs> Receive this benediction. God of abundance, correct us every time we think of scarcity when it comes to your grace, your mercy, and your love so that we may see in this world the opportunities that we have that look hopeless to indeed inject that into these situations that we may indeed share your good news with others. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go and serve the Lord.